Hi everyone, I'm Steve Young. I'm the director of product marketing at SmartShoot, and I've got with me an awesome guest. His name is Dotan Sagi, and he he ran a Kickstarter campaign that raised over a hundred thousand dollars. And we're gonna we brought him here to talk about the video creation process and more about just Kickstarter in general. So, hi Dotan, how you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me on. So let's start. Let's talk about the product. What is the product that you put on Kickstarter? Sure. Um, there's been a couple. The one you're referring to raised over $150,000, and that was a, an accessory for iPad, uh, and that in more specifically with iPad with the smart cover. So uh, the product uh, basically allows you to use your iPad with the smart cover in more stand positions than it's originally intended to be used. Uh, one of the frustration that people have with the smart cover, which is the number one you know cover for iPad, that's the only Apple uh, cover. Um, the the frustration people have is that it only does two stand positions that are fairly limited and not very stable uh, for one of them. And uh, what people want is really to hold their for the iPad to be held at about a 45 degree angle for reading and browsing and gaming and so on. Um, but the smart cover doesn't do that originally, and, and uh, I invented a product that basically enables it to do that. Great. We, so I saw the video, and I'm going to put the video somewhere in the post too, so it could be up top or at the bottom, but definitely look for it because it's a fantastic video. So, Dotan, I wanted to start out with, did you have a built-in audience to, to no, promote the Kickstarter campaign? No, I didn't. Campaign? I mean, this is, I've never done a, a physical product before. I'm a software guy, and I've, uh, I've got a whole bunch of uh, apps in the App Store, and I've been in software all my life. So this was kind of a, one of those ideas that, you know, happened at the breakfast table, and, and I, as you'll see in the video, uh, and uh, I kind of wanted to... Uh, you know, to try it out and see uh, what a what a, a you know making a product was like and launching it on Kickstarter. So that was a total experiment, um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, that no no prior audience or anything. And and when I launched it, it's kind of, kind of a funny story actually. The way I launched it, I, I had actually done quite a bit of research. And we'll go more into uh, you know what what I think is really important to to nail that video and and the Kickstarter page. But I had done quite a bit of work to, to get the Kickstarter page ready and the video ready and everything. And I had shown it to a bunch of friends and gotten feedback several times. And I was really procrastinating with it and very kind of gun shy and pressing that publish button. And uh, it, so it happened, uh, the timing happened such that I was in Paris uh, visiting for a couple of months, working from there for a couple of months. Uh, when I was finally ready to launch it. I had the Kickstarter approval and everything. It was really up to me when I wanted to push this live. And one day I was just sitting at a cafe in Paris with my Wi-Fi uh, you know, thing uh, enabled and on my laptop and you know, sipping an espresso. And, and I was like, I really got to push this live. And uh, so I hit the publish button and I went back to email. And I was like, you know, nothing's going to happen. It's 2 o'clock in Paris. It's 5 a.m. in LA. No one's going to even look at this for the next few hours. I had a couple of blogger friends that I was going to tell this was live, but I, you know they weren't going to be awake just yet. So I just pressed that button and kind of forgot about it and went back to email. And then in my email, as I was typing in an email, I see like one email from Kickstarter and then another one and another one. It's so basically all the orders starting to come in like two minutes, literally two minutes after I posted the, the project live. And I was like, this is not possible. Even the video is two minutes long. So this means somebody watched halfway through the video and then placed an order without looking at anything. So I was just kind of blown away what, what, the, you know, what the impact of that video had. So anyway, yeah, I think that's... it's a great video. And so I want to go dive into sort of the whole production process. How did you first come up with the initial concept for the video? Um, so I watched, I don't know if it's hundreds, but does easily dozens of, of Kickstarter videos before uh, even writing the script for this. Um, once I knew I wanted to launch a Kickstarter project, I really had no idea how to launch one. And I, I actually uh, connected with a buddy who had, who did. Uh, launch one, and, and he really insisted that the video was the most important thing. So I researched really a lot of Kickstarter videos, 
any product that was remotely relevant to what I was doing, I, I would watch the video and make notes about what I what I thought worked, what I thought didn't work. Um, what the, the beauty of Kickstarter also is that you can see what um, m how much money the projects have raised. So you can tell which have good videos versus bad just by how much they've raised. Of course, there's other criteria like, you know, is the product a good one and so on. But the video has so much impact that you can pretty much tell. The, the ones that have raised a lot of money, typically it's because they have a, a great video. Um, and then, the, you know, you can also watch, I think it's also informative to watch some that seem like they have a good product but tanked and, uh, and see what kind of video and what, what might have uh, compromised their project uh, based on the video. So what did you learn from watching all those videos? Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, there, there's no, Kickstarter doesn't really give any guidelines other than work on your video a lot. I mean, there, there's a few things, they, 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 a few tips, but I think all in all, um, you have to kind of go back to what people expect on Kickstarter. They're really feeling like they're backing a, 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 an inventor uh, and enabling them to make something happen. So I think, you know, it has to sound genuine and, you know, in my case, though, I had no problem. I wasn't really playing a game there. I was truly clueless and trying to get my project done. So I was, you know, I, I guess there's a, it's, it's a balance because you can't sound completely clueless or people won't find you, you know, they, they won't think you can actually pull this off. Uh, but if you sound too professional or the, the video really looks too professional, uh, I, I think that that's also uh, kind of a, a red flag for people. So I think, um, you know, I think it's a matter of saying uh, what, you know, how the idea, how the idea came up. Uh, people like for you to share kind of how, what your thought process was, what the prototyping process was, and how you got to the, where the product is right now. Um, and, and, and I think it, at the end of the day, it's it's a commercial, so you have to kind of show some leg in terms of what the product prototype looks like, what it does. Uh, it really has to sound compelling, because some I, I, I was saying earlier, some people really see this as they're backing an inventor, but I think most people who will buy you the product will actually don't really know that they they, they feel like they're just buying a product like they would on Amazon. So so you kind of have to be able to appeal to both audiences. And so it has to, to sound, you know, you can't be selling. I think it's very ineffective to actually sell and say this is the best so-and-so and, -so and sound like a commercial. But at, at, le at the end of the day, it has to kind of give people, uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, nudge to, to, to go and, and pledge. So it has to be, you, ha you have to kind of make it feel like something that they really want to use and can't live without. I think those are valuable insights. So you want to definitely personalize the video, make sure that you're backing the inventor, and then you don't want to oversell. You want to talk more about the product and right. what it, the pain it solves rather than saying, this is the best product you got to buy. And right. So what's and, that and first? I just want to stop one second because you said something very true in terms of the pain point, making people relate to the pain point, I think is absolutely crucial. And I think um, that's something I kind of almost like accidentally did very well in my video. I, I didn't think it would have that much impact. But when I, it, you'll see if you look at the video, at one point in the video I show the two positions that the smart cover goes into and why they're problematic. And when I showed this video, I mean obviously I can't see the reaction of people who've watched, you know, thousands of people who've watched this video, but when I show it to my friends I can see their reaction and, and every single time if they have an iPad with a smart cover they'll be like that's totally me like they, they totally recognize themselves in this I hate you know how it's limited and I wanted to put it in this position that it doesn't have and I think at, at, the, at the point in the video where they feel that pain point they're ready to be sold on why this is the greatest idea and I think what uh, that's a great thing to for them to latch on and I think that's a very effective selling tool yeah, as long as they can feel, you know, they relate to the pain that you're expressing um, in, in the pain point. Yeah, I think you did a great job of showing us why you decided to build this product. And it, it was sort of like the journey. Here's the pain that I'm having right now, and here's the solution that I sort of came up with helping solve that pain. So when you have that video idea and that concept in your head, what's that first step you took? Well, um, 
you know, this was really a first for me. Like I said, I'm, I'm a software guy. So, uh, but I, as a kid, I was also playing with Legos, like everyone, and uh, you know, I like tinkering with things. So, so uh, the first thing I did was, there's got to be a way to for the smart cover to hold straight, and you know, if I can isolate one of the folds, you know, let's see what it does. So I went and you know, went into the kitchen, grabbed the you know one of those. Uh, Clips, you know, to like clo re close, you know, bags of chips and stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was like, "What if I clip something on there? Will it stay straight?" And sure, sure enough, of course it does. Uh, and, and then I, I kind of evolved the product from there. I was like, "Okay, well, yeah, a clip is nice, but I wouldn't want to keep a clip on my iPad. Plus, it might scratch the screen, and I'd have to carry the clip around with me." So I went into kind of like, "Okay, what would, um, you know, what would be the ideal thing to hold this iPad cover and?" So I went and grabbed, I think I had some uh, old IKEA stuff, uh, not IKEA, um, stuff from the container store that was for folders that, that would kind of uh, clip to a folder. And that was much less uh, bulky than a, a cheap a chips bag clip. So I put that on there, and that worked better. And then I realized that, that it would be great if the, the clips could stay on the iPad cover and could slide back and forth. And so I went through iterations of different kind of just homemade prototypes. And once I had a good, good, good enough idea for what I wanted to build, then I, I went out and found uh, somebody who did 3D, you know, CAD design, and I basically sketched up for him what I wanted to make and worked with him in making a first prototype. Then, okay. you know, then, then you've got, you know, once you've got a 3D prototype, you can print, uh, you know, 3D print something and start experimenting with your 3D print, and you can do several, you know, several turns of this pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, and experiment with all of them before you even think of going to a factory. So let's talk about the video itself. Sure. When you had you're like you're ready to shoot. What's or let's take a step step back a little bit. But you want to do the video. Do you start storyboarding at all? Yeah. Um, so I'm you know I'm not a video guy. So this this whole thing. I, I live in L.A. and is when I'm at Starbucks invariably I'm the only one working on geeky you know software or hardware stuff. Everybody else is working on a script for Hollywood. So I I don't really know. Like I was pretty clueless about how to shoot a video. Uh, what um, I I did naturally was hey you know let's just write up the script of what I think we should show in the video. And um, with maybe like in parentheses what what we would show like what I would say plus what we would show while I was saying it. So I just kind of took you know I opened uh, pages on on the Mac and I just started typing you know and and then it came pretty naturally and then I closed the document and forgot about it and then reread it the next day and I was like oh this is horrible and kind of iteratively you know over the next week or so just refined the script and. Um, well, I, the biggest challenge in, in writing a script I found, which you know, again, this was a very new process for me, was staying, you know, writing, but then finding enough distance to be able to criticize it and tweak it, and really try to listen to the script from the point of view of a of a viewer and not of yourself. And that that's, I mean, I'm sure that's like a common <laughs> Hollywood, uh, uh, you know, script writer uh, uh, problem, but that I was encountering it for the first time. So I think having the time, leaving yourself a couple of weeks to refine the script, be critical of it, show it to other people, get feedback, you know, that whole process takes time, and I think you just have to allow the time for that to happen. You finished the script, and then you found somebody to actually shoot the video, right? Right. So, and I must say, I was kind of lucky in that those guys were able to do what I wanted to do because it was a fairly simple script and a fairly simple execution. There weren't any kind of special effects needed or anything, um, and and the the editing was very basic. Uh, and I had to do a lot of the um, directing. And obviously, I wrote the script, and so I had to, they had to be guided a lot. Um, it turns out for a new product I want to do right now, I'm going to need something more sophisticated, more editing, and they're not. I know those guys aren't going to cut it, so that that's where I think you know I, I was. Uh, I think that's how I found you. Actually, I was I was looking at uh, uh, you know what, what I could do uh, through through your website. So that's yeah, no, totally. But I want to go in sequence, so. You sure. found the guys, they shoot the video. How long did that video take? And how many takes did you kind of do? 
Um, God, I, I'm terrible at uh, you know being the you know in front of the camera. I'm a kind of uh, admitted uh, uh, you know uh, I, I'm just kind of sh you know shy in front of the camera, and I'm I'm not comfortable you know pronouncing you know saying a script and and remembering stuff. Uh, so. I was mortified. I was, so it took a lot of takes. It took, and I think basically we did like a, a ton of takes, and then we found a better way to do it because I would screw up every single one. At the end of the at the end of the session, basically one of the guys went to the back of the room, and we pretended like I was answering his questions, and that's the only way I was able to do it. So he would prompt me to say, you know, he would ask me a question that would prompt my script, and I would answer him to him, but looking at him. I kind of I would forget about the camera, and that that's how we ended up doing it. But it, it, it it's it's not. I think for a lot of people who want to do a Kickstarter project, you have to be in front of the camera if you're going to do it. Like it, it's just you know, people have to get a sense for who you are, and a, a big part of what you're selling is your ability to deliver this product and your vision. And I think a lot of inventors are introverts like me. And you know, for them to get in front of a camera is really totally you know, unnatural. So it's anyway. That's just that might be a tip that that's helpful in terms of you know finding somebody where you can speak to, pretending the camera is not there. <laughs> no, completely. This is a, something that we actually do with our small business profile videos. We actually have you look at the camera, the filmmaker, and you're answering a bunch of questions. And it's so much easier to answer questions when you're actually looking at somebody rather than right. looking at a machine or a camera right. or film. Because right. you and I, I freeze up every time I'm looking at a machine and trying to talk to the machine. Right, right. So what other advice would you give anyone looking to do a video for their Kickstarter or any crowdfunding platform campaign? Um, um, well, the, the, you know, I, I think really at the, at the end of the day, the most important is to really get a sense on Kickstarter of what works and what doesn't work. Um, and there is no substitute. I mean, it might sound silly to spend two, two days, like block a day or two, and all you're doing is watching Kickstarter videos. <laughs> uh, and there are some terrible ones, and it's kind of painful to watch but but I think there you at the end of the day if you're going to shoot one yourself you, you need to go through that and get a sense of, of what's uh, what people are doing what's good what's not good um, that there, there's a, the the other thing is I think you have to have um, I mean it's better I think uh, to sound credible and make the product put the product in the best light to 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 give your video a certain style I personally like the kind of the minimalist Style of the Apple commercials with the white background and black T-shirt kind of you know kind of thing. Um, it works for my products and that kind of gives it that um, you know that extra Apple feel, which you know they're meant for Apple products, so it's kind of a it's a good um, combination. So that 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 also is something to think about, you know, because I, I see a lot of videos where people I don't know what they were thinking. They were basically film. In front of their garage, or <laughs> it's, there's no thought as to where they they're filming and what's in the background, and like, or they're at their desk and there's like a pile of cable in the back, cables in the back, and like a trash can, or like, you have to kind of think about, you know, getting some of the that clutter and, and noise out of the out of the frame. Uh, but if you're working with people who know what they're doing, I guess that you know that's something that. You, you shouldn't uh, uh, shouldn't run into problems. I think a lot of people just think uh, they're you know everybody has an HD camera now and everybody has iMovie so or or some some other video editing software and it's you know so everything they everybody think thinks they, they can they can shoot their own Kickstarter video and save a you know a few hundred or a thousand dollars and it's not necessarily the best uh, you know the best thing they can do. In my case, the kicks, you know the video itself cost a fraction of the cut of the of the revenue that I, I ended up uh, collecting on Kickstarter. So it's it's really uh, you know it, it's not a good um, it's a good investment to make to, to find you know people who know how to do this stuff and can can uh, I think I was lucky in, in in not making some of those mistakes because I, I you know I, I could easily have uh, fallen you know with you know the wrong people and and uh, so anyway it's. How much were you looking to raise? 
through the campaign. I was looking. Well, so the, the I mean, I, we could do a whole another <laughs> interview on Kickstarter. That's a whole another you know thing. There's a lot of strategies for for other than the video. Um, but uh, the, one of the things to nail down is is how much what what is your goal, and it's not necessarily how much money you need. It could be it can be influenced by other things. In my case, I needed more. I think I put ten thousand dollars as the as the goal. Um, in my case, I needed more than ten thousand dollars to make, get this done. Um, maybe fifteen or twenty, but I, I wanted to make the that amount low enough so I would attain it quickly. And on Kickstarter, once you attain the the funding goal, a lot of people jump on board who were kind of waiting on the sidelines uh, to see if the project was going to get made. Uh, because there's so many projects that don't attain their goal, so people don't want to waste their time pledging on them. So, so anyway, so I, I put it low on purpose, knowing that I was going to uh, I was going to need more money, but I was betting that I would attain that quickly, and then it would allow me to go much further. So that would that was my thinking there. And after you put hit publish on the campaign, what kind of promotion did you do? So after I published, um, like I said, I kind of sat back and sipped my espresso and <laughs> um, and then I contacted my, uh, I have like a couple you know, bloggers that I know who posted, uh, but then it got picked up, I think naturally, there's a, a natural kind of um, thing on Kickstarter where the new projects come on a new projects page and people notice them that way. You have very little time. I think that at the time I might have stayed like maybe half a day on that page, uh, or at the top of the page. Um, so I, I did get some attention from, attention from that. I think some people, some other bloggers noticed it either from the first blog postings or uh, from uh, the the new project on Kickstarter. Then I contacted a few more. So I, I once I saw that the bloggers liked the story, I started contacting more bloggers. And uh, and you can always you know once you start contacting them and they see there's kind of a uh, virtual you know uh, not a virtual a, a virtuous uh, cycle that that goes on that once your project takes off people see that, oh wow you know he blew away he is his goal in 24 hours that's a story in and of itself so then you get more stories and and uh, and so on but the what I learned which I didn't know at the time so I kind I was kind of lucky on that one. Uh, the first 24 hours are absolutely crucial because you're benefiting from that new new projects page placement. You can get some stories because it's a new it's a new project, so uh, that in itself is a is a good story. Um, and so the the more people you can bring to the, your page that day, uh, the 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 bigger the chances for the for the project to succeed in the long term. Uh, well, Tom, this has been fantastic. Is there anything else you want to add before we say goodbye? Um, no, well, uh, people should check out, you know, if, if you want to in, in, inspire yourself from my project, project pages, uh, you can look up the Smarter Stand for iPad. There's been another one, the Smarter Stand for iPhone, also on Kickstarter, so you can look up those pages. Um, if you just love the product and you want to buy it, um, they're both at smarterflow.com. That's smarterflo.com. Um, so I, I sell them there for, for retail, and I think they're on Amazon as well, and they'll be in stores um, soon as well. Cool. Well, I'm going to put all those links in this blog post, but thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the knowledge, and this was great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Glad to share. Okay.